The first game walked so this game could crawl. My thoughts on this game were mixed when I finished it about a month ago and I have had some time to gather my thoughts for this video. I love this game since the first game was so captivating that I can't remember how many times I've watched different playthroughs just to see how people would deduce the case with the protagonist. It was the game that made me discover Uchikoshi's work that led me to playing the Zero Escape series. I still remember how excited I was when I heard the safe game sound effect being the same as either Somnium Files when I first played 999. This game starts out strong and charming like the first game with all the improvement and the budget I wish the first game could have. The visual, animation, especially the character's expression have greatly improved. And my god, the soundtrack were exceptional, just like the first game but for Nirvana Initiative, I think Ito Keisuke has captured the vibe of the game perfectly. The main theme sounded much more darker and sinister than the first game which got me excited to dive into the story when I first launched the game. He also managed to capture the theme of every song names and locations. I think the first track that really captured my heart was Brahmin's theme song, Record of Brahmin. It's so comfy and homey that I could listen to it all day. New renditions of old soundtrack from a previous game were also a treat to listen to. The UI is as good as the first game. I'm still impressed by how the camera interacts with the 3D space with X-ray and thermograph. Characters actually look at other characters when talking, making the conversation feel natural and easy to absorb the story along with the voice lines. The voice acting was Great as usual, I love it. I love everyone's performances, especially Mizuki, Ryuki, and Amama as a voice actor. If you know, you know. I would also like to mention the lock function. The voice line pauses when you open the lock or menu to check something, and then resumes after you exit. It's super useful and it doesn't disturb the flow of the conversation, as well as the flowchart function, where you can go back to a certain point to check something, which I think should be a standard for Vision Novel. Sure, that's okay. What do you mean? I mean, maybe there are reality issues. Oh, don't worry about that. The higher-ups will take care of it for me. They also added a new gameplay mode, Virtual Reality Activation, which I would describe as a Detroit Become Human-like investigation mode, where you walk around the crime scene in VR to look for clues, and by the end of the section, you have to deduce and reenact what happened, which I think is a welcome addition. I also love the soundtrack that was playing during the investigation. Very Ace Attorney vibe, which I really like. I also like the bonus content like Dress Up, Tamagotchi, Life Advice, and there's one that I don't want to spoil but um, it's related to one of Uchigoshi's previous work. I really like that and it doesn't hinder your playtime and you don't have to do it if you don't feel like it. But I just feel like they have the budget to do it, that's why they did it which is pretty cool. Wing Sing was a pretty cool function but it's kind of annoying that you can only Wing Sing once a scene where there are a few people you can Wing Sing with in the same era so you have to save and reload a bunch of times if you want to see all of them. It just feels like a cheap way to get replay value. Overall, I prefer the darker tone and vibe that the game's direction was taking. They set the tone of the story pretty well from the beginning, even more serious and moody than its predecessor, although the first game's opening was pretty sick. With less flavored text when investigating eras which I personally wish they could have kept throughout the game, some texts were even recycled themes from the first game, and most of them were just a simple sentence stating what that item is. Like what's the point of implementing them for the players to check on if it doesn't have anything interesting to say? So if you're interested in playing this game, I said go for it. It's amazing yet flow like any other games out there, and there's definitely passion behind this project. I'm happy that the developers had more budget to create the games they wanted this time. I can tell they put tons of love into this, and I'm glad that I got to play this. In the next section of the video, I'll be talking about the reason why I gave it a 7 out of 10 instead of a 9 out of 10 for the previous game. There will be spoilers, so proceed with caution and go play the game if you're interested and haven't played it yourself. For those who have played the game, buckle up and get your pitchfork ready because this is going to be purely my opinion and extremely biased. If you love the game, more power to you, I am as well to some degree, and I still think the series is charming and has a lot of potential. And that's that. Despite all the things I like about this game, the issue I have with this story is mainly the writing. This game relies heavily on contrivances and gimmicks in order to make the story work. The ending just kind of left me unsatisfied, even though I was all giddy during the climax where everyone was there to fight the bad guys, but that's it. That feeling was temporary, the post-game clarity was real, it left me empty but not in a good way unfortunately. While the plot was initially really interesting, it sets the tone of the prologue and the first Somnium so well that it kept me invested. The second half of the game just kind of took a nosedive, and there were quite a lot of plot holes left unresolved. We will talk about those in another segment later. The story sometimes feels like a train wreck. You jump from this place, investigate, then suddenly a filler scene where you spend time interacting with characters and you get nothing useful. A lot of Mizuki's route felt like aimless wandering, then goes to another location to look for clues. And oh my god, there's so many locations by the way. 
Some characters are actively hiding information to the last minute, like Shomai's Amame's little brother. Isn't something you should tell the players in the first few hours? The characters was also kind of dismissive in some scenes as well, like Boss for example, stating that she has a daughter but Huh? The player doesn't know? Cause you didn't ask? Oh, important stuff that players should know about? Ah, it's okay, we will talk about that later. Oh man, Ryuki's having another mental breakdown. Nah, it's fine, just let him be. And oh my god, this poor man. Ryuki and Tama didn't even get as much screen time than I expected. He basically become a side character in his own game. I mean, for at least half of this game. <laughs> He deserves better for real. Not only does he have one of the most tragic backstory in the game with his parents being dead, his own twin brother got run over by a truck, no one cares enough about his mental health, he was too eager to solve the case and ended up almost shooting a civilian, not to mention being threatened with demotion by boss unless he can solve the case in 3 days. Despite him clearly losing his grip on reality, he got blackmailed by terror, betraying everyone, causing Mizuki to lose her right eye, Kizuna's ability to walk, and Date being potentially dead. Who he apparently had a crush on, but the game did elaborate further, so we don't know. Then, during those six years, drowning himself with alcohol, his mental spirals downwards and starts to have psychosis from time to time. I'm surprised he didn't get taken off the force, or worse, get prosecuted and sent to prison. I was looking forward to explore his background and playing as a broken character, trying to redeem himself while coping with his mental health, but he ends up being irrelevant for the second half of the game, and was just there to be an unreliable narrator for the story, and for the sake of the plot twist that is coming later on. He has so much potential but was so underwritten at times. I thought he'd be a typical anime protagonist, but after this route, I feel like there's something more to his character than the game didn't get to explore. Yes, he loves justice, but then I think he's trying to do so in order to cope with his brother's death. So he pretends to be a hero, like doing my hero's reference like half might. Not all might because his other half is fucking dead. Also, there's a scene where you can see some of his ego creeping out when he got threatened with a demotion, despite him being a well-mannered and polite person. Which I wanted the game to explore more on that side of him. Then fast forward to the end, he appears during the last fight and takes a bullet for Date before having a bro slash redemption moment, then he just fucking quote unquote dies as if that solved the angst with everyone. Then surprise surprise, he's alive cause this game has no stakes. Then we have a dance number, woohoo everyone is happy and Ryuki is no longer mentally ill and purge free cause he got vaccinated off screen. The end. That's it. The sound names in this game has vastly improved. The reverse sync was really cool, though it was a bit unfortunate that this is the only time we get to see it. The gameplay has become quite linear and easier so that the player no longer has to blindly guess the answer, though I was stuck on this puzzle for quite a while because my dumbass forgot 2 times 0 is 0 not 2. Some people will say that this defeats the purpose, since dreams don't make sense, but I personally like this direction. Some of the sound names have some great ideas, and the mechanics to unlock the mental locks were really creative. I also like how they included puzzles and QTE difficulty for casual players, as well as unlimited sync so you can explore without the time limit. The stealth in the masked woman Somnium is a bit broken, but I can tell they are experimenting so I'll let it slide. Plus it did convey the anxiety that she was experiencing during her time in the facility so that's pretty interesting. However, in my opinion, some Somniums were unnecessary just for a few nuggets of information like Iris. Trust me, I love Iris' Somnium with the gags and all but the information we got from her was kinda underwhelming. Kizuna again and Shoma's Somnium as well. The design and creativity behind the Somniums were great, but story-wise it's hindering the investigation rather than a welcoming change of pace. Plus, why would some character willingly follow the protagonist back to Abyss to get synced when they have secrets to hide from the police? I mean, unless the protagonist hit them with a gas like Boss did to Ota in the first game, even then, the pacing makes no sense sometimes. Like, oh, so you're not going to tell us what you're hiding? Okay, it's sinking time. Cut back to Abyss immediately, we sink and get the info, then get the fuck out, and continue investigating, rinse and repeat. There's no time to take a breather. In contrast, I like the moment in the first game where Date thinks about the case as he drives on an endless highway. It's like you are winding down with Date and Aiba, discussing the case out loud. But for this game, you go from point A to B in a snap. You don't get to stop and ponder what you just missed or why things ended and started so abruptly, as if you just skip a few chapters, but it's designed to be that way. This wouldn't make sense until the twist is shown to you. This game doesn't want you to solve the case, they want to tell you how this case is solved. Ryuki's limo was kind of underused. It could have been where Ryuki and Tama or even Mizuki talk about the case. Unfortunately, they didn't do that. I think the first game did better than a sequel in this section. The action scenes were awkward and lengthy. It just consists of you beating up crowds of nameless NPCs while you just sit there and wait till the QT pops up. Yes, it shows that they have more budget for better choreography this time. Here are some of my favorites. 
but most of them were unnecessary and overstayed its welcome. The sound designs were barely there, and the pacing for most of the fight were painfully slow, like how the camera slowly pans from left to right, up and down sometimes. It's kinda annoying if you fail the QTE and then you have to retry the whole scene. Thankfully, there's a fast forward button, but it doesn't excuse it being super awkward, so I think it's better to use the action scenes sparingly. That applies to the dance too, by the way. Some of them had melted like a rotten banana, while others ended up with their bodies entirely burned and blackened. Others were said to have merged with the steel hull, their bodies having become a piece of the ship. Does that sound familiar? You mean Jin? Are you saying his right half teleported here? It isn't impossible. If a seam was torn, that is. Also, what pisses me off is that they set up so much by the cult leaders, especially the cops, right? They done that shit, right? And they turn around and be like, Hmm, it was a glitch in the world. No, bitch, your subject fucking cut your son in half. And you just gotta full on cope him and be like, Hmm, it was the program, the seam. No, bitch, you fucking caused this shit. Like, okay, shut the fuck up and stop being mysterious. You get what I mean? By subject, I mean the experiment subject, I mean Uru, okay? While it's interesting how Ryuki and Mizuki are split into two routes with two different time periods, however, that made it awkward for both of the characters. The first half doesn't have enough Mizuki, and the second half doesn't have enough Ryuki. I thought they'd go with Yakuza Zero's approach, going back and forth from Ryuki and Mizuki's perspective to gather clues, then the both of them would eventually exchange notes and solve the case together as a team. That didn't happen, cause then there won't be any twists which we will be talking about next, the elephant in the room, the main twist, which isn't even revealed to the characters but exclusively to the player, aka the Freya non diegetically by Mama during an intermission chapter between Mizuki's route. She breaks the 4-4 and tells you that you have been experiencing the timeline in the wrong order, dropping hints that this world might or might not be a simulation. It's not like that. It's like this. This is the timeline that you actually experienced. The red and blue lines are intertwined, almost like DNA. You started on the red line from the top, and then followed the blue line which led you to this point. You've traversed four X's. When I reached this part, I couldn't help but wonder if this could have been done better the other way and thought is this the reason why no one was questioning the weird gaps in some chapters? It feels like no one communicates in this game. Clearly, something was off with the pacing, as if there's some sort of discrepancy, right? When this twist happened, and everything sort of clicked, it was not like the first game where you started to be like, oh my god, it all makes sense now. It was more like, oh my god, how can they fuck up this badly? I was just sitting there appalled at this. On one hand, not gonna lie, I was still impressed with how they managed to write around this twist that fits with the DNA theme. I've nothing but respect for the writer to write this crazy ass story. But on the other hand, it just feels so cheap that it takes you out of the experience of being the detective solving a case. There was no plot twist because the game mechanic itself was a plot twist. Not to mention the narrator being unreliable and some characters design being inconsistent. Next, we move right back to Mizuki's route. Suddenly, we are at Brahman with Lian, Kizuna, Date dressed as Gen, and Bibi. The game shows you the corpse and clues Mizuki found in the previous route. Basically, the game was like, okay, now you know the twist, chop chop, let's move on, and Mizuki, who probably knows almost nothing, got confused about all this since the Mizuki we played in the <laughs> in some chapters was actually Bibi who looked just like Mizuki six years ago. Then we have a Suicide Squad moment where everyone is sitting at the restaurant explaining what they did. Date, Bibi and Lian explain their side. Kizuna is just there, I guess. It turns out Date has been playing Among Us the whole time after losing his memory for the second time. He was pretending to be Gen in order to gather information from the cult members that frequents Gen's shop. Like what? Why are we not the one who are getting this information? Why didn't he inform Mizuki and Gyu, Reed and Ryuki of anything the moment he recovered his memory? Hell, at one point, Ryuki was in Brahman gathering information while Date was pretending to be Gen. Also, I cannot believe Gen would just agree to let Date take over his restaurant for a few days, despite him being very serious about his restaurant, you know? But it's okay, I'll let that slide because it's kind of funny to to see <laughs> Date dress up as Gen, I guess. This makes me wonder if the real Gen would have had something to add when Tokiko was mentioned. Because I thought Gen had something to do with Nizaloth since he appeared in Tokiko Somnium. Like bruh, they turned Nizaloth, which was supposedly a red herring in the first game, to something real in this game, 
and the person who told us, aka Iris, didn't have any huge reaction to it. Even then, the goal of the cult is different from the first game. It used to be the Wajet system trying to build a huge satellite. However, Tokiko debunked it, saying that the rumors were incorrect. And now it's an organization trying to prove this world is a simulation and, uh, and escape from it, like seek a way out. They think of a clever way to retcon this, which I think I quite like it. All these hidden bats, QR video, achieve moksha, order of percent, the Philadelphia experiment, and genome experiment stuff were interesting and it seemed to set up something big for the second half of the story, but it goes nowhere and it turns out they were just saving their son. They found this out from Tokiko's diary, by the way, not even a confession from her mouth because she's fucking dead. And the main theme plays and I was like, that's it? I mean, she did state that she wrote it for the Freyer. Not sure if this is hinting that she wanted us to find this so that we can solve the case, but if that's the reason, why did all of this happen? Well, maybe Chikara wants more out of the experiment, and Uru just had a huge Stockholm Syndrome and wanted love and attention, which understandable, that poor guy. They touched upon all this issue on a surface level, but never delved deep enough for it to go anywhere. It's like they forgot about it, so what's the point? I don't think adding all this convoluted stuff is going to mask a very simple story. I like the theme of family and the pain of losing them, but it feels like they have too much on their plate this time. I do like Komeji's involvement in the case, because he seemed so irrelevant at first, but he somehow got unlucky that he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, plus drunk as hell when all this happened and created this chain of events. But why would Komeji know that the body belongs to Terror and steal it for some ransom? Like yes, he's involved with gun trading business, but not body trading business. So I just think the writer needed another body so Uru can redo his ex master spot thing. And Shoma's ending was a diversion ending to have a sweet closure between the father and son's relationship that mirrors the first game with Ota and Mayumi. Plus that Shoma can give the player the name Dahlia before the credits. And this name didn't matter except for unlocking Mizuki's opening route later on. The other route gave the player the name Boat, and it also revealed why Ryuki was so guilt written for the past 6 years, which I quite liked actually. But then the name Dahlia Boat had no impact on the story whatsoever. The name was so irrelevant that I forgot the first name when I had to enter the name in Ryuki's reverse somnium, because I didn't know that I needed to write it down. Like, <laughs> The game didn't even explain the name's meaning. You can argue that it's an anagram of Iyadaboth, I'm not so sure if I pronounce it right, please correct me, that comes from Nauticism, but it didn't really touch upon the theme of the game. They focus more on Hinduism with terms like Brahman, Dvaita, and Moksha. So if the game didn't officially state it, I would take the fan theories with a grain of salt. Though I do like Ryuki's crazy laugh though. Really good performances from both Ryuki's voice actors. <laughs> <laughs> I would just classify this as an unexplained red herring. The first game has a lot of red herrings too, but it somehow ties with the story. But in this game, it's just completely irrelevant. Some characters were trying so hard not to give you any information, and you have to sit through their one-dimensional inner feelings and desire like marrying a girl because she's cute, and I don't take no as an answer, which I think that's borderline obsessive stalker behavior, but no one really questions it. I'll pretend I didn't hear that. Or joining a cult because my dad is cringe and I hate myself, the world is not real. Singing in the Kiza Somnium because big sis don't go such. While I'm at it, in the first game, some characters seem irrelevant, but they are indirectly connected with each other if you think about it. For example, Renjo is hanging out with Date, a killer of his best friend, well at least the body, not the mind, and the mind was dating his other best friend he told me. Shoko and Renjo had connections with the Kumakura gang, Aris works for Renjo, she and Date, which is Saito's body, are half-siblings. <laughs> like the more you think about it, the more the other characters interrelate with each other. Unfortunately for this game, some characters were dead just cause um, the plot demands it. Lian is there just to open locks. Kizuna, she dances and is being pursued by Lian because he, he saw her dance from a distance I guess? 
She also has a rich father who owns an orphanage that has connection with the Horador Institute, but they didn't really delve into that much, which was a waste, in my opinion. The detective who investigate cold cases, was he even necessary other than showing us the voice clip he interviewed with the bodyguard on the rooftop? Moma, I love ya, but why are you in this game, other than being a participant in the quiz show and an introduction to the Vojlo show? I feel like Date was there to get killed off for dramatic purposes, and no one goes down to the cathedral to look for his corpse? So Sojima just appeared in one scene, and you could remove him, and the story would just go on. Isn't he supposed to be out of the country by the way? I don't mind that Uru is So's son, but the story could have just stated it instead of showing Terra talking to So. Wait. But then we wouldn't have Iris sneaking behind it and is dropping about the executed chamber guard. You, you see what I mean? Technically, the story even makes sense if you follow the true flowchart, but some parts just felt like it's written in a certain way in order to make the main twist work. It took the mystery away and the joy of discovering the plot for yourself. This is no longer a detective game, it's just a crime thriller. The timeline twist may seem similar to VRR or even ZTD, but why does those games work and not this game? It's because in VLR, the timeline helps you, but in the Valor Initiative, it hinders you from a very linear story disguised as a twist. In the first game, it does have a linear story too, but the possibility branches out like a tree root. Some are long and short, and it follows the same set of events. For example, in some timelines, Saito manages to switch bodies till the end, while in another timeline, he fails and dies. In this game, the rocket will launch no matter what, it's just at the true end, you and your nakamas get to destroy it with the power of friendship, anime superpowers, and plot armor. Almost everything is spelled out for you, except for figuring out where the rocket would launch during February 15th. And all you have to do is press next to see it get solved by the characters themselves. For example, at the end where boss asks everyone to deliver a message to the Mizukis, then they just solve it for the players. Which to be fair, I didn't really care at that point, so thanks game? I do like the half-body twist where the left side of Jin Furuya is actually Jin and the right side is Uru, hence the 6 year gap. I would say that's the Ushikoshi magic that could have saved the game's story, but it just isn't enough for this game. Unlike the first game with the body switching twist, that twist got me good, and it actually felt like that the game gave you enough clues to figure out compared to this game where they just straight up reveal it to you. My disappointment was immeasurable when I saw the cutting machine down in the basement, and my theory was ruined. Also, I don't know why Uru was fixated on Amame. Is it so that the story can make her kill him? It's a bit cliche that it was a revenge murder, but at least it was backed up by hints of her being anxious and suspicious. Her son must also greatly foreshadow it, which I think is pretty good. Also what makes the first game better in terms of uh, red herring is that everyone is suspicious. It feels like everyone could have done it. Except for Mizuki of course. but. In the second game, it feels like you just have a gut feeling that some of the characters just didn't really matter in the story. It's just like they don't seem to be like the killer. A bit disappointing, but maybe this is not their intention this time to make everyone suspicious because like in the first game, everything is so condensed, you know, like and everyone is somehow connected to the case. So I just I, I just really like that and I find it very interesting. And for the second game, it just didn't feel like it. Like some characters don't even matter, you know. Speaking of Uru, I'm not sure if this would rub people or the creators the wrong way, but since Ryuki's backstory was neglected, especially the story with his twin brother, I have an idea that could tie Ryuki into the story better with his twin being involved in the case. I think Ryuki's brother's face could have been transplanted onto Uru's left half instead of having a synthetic skin. Half of his organs as well, because Uru's not going to survive with half of his organs, right? So I think that would have made the story much more impactful. We could follow the canon timeline where half of his brother's body gets run over by the wanted criminal who is also linked to the Horadori Institute, but he doesn't die right away. Instead, he fights for his life in the hospital but unfortunately dies due to an arson incident. Uru finds out about the car accident and asks Chikara if he could implant Ryuki's brother's left face and organs to Uru as a part of the experiment. Chikara agrees and steals Ryuki's brother and switches him with a stranger and sets it on fire along with the room to make it unrecognizable and destroy the DNA. So that means Ryuki's brother's gonna die anyway, so I'm sorry. Not only does it mirror the termite reaction of Jin's body at Studio Devita, it would strengthen the reason why Ryuki's mental state is what it is, and he gets more involved in the case. I think that would be much more impactful in my opinion, even though it's my brain rot, because he mentioned that he has a twin brother, and it does nothing in the story, and I was like, what? 
then why would you mention it? I mean, it does have a role in the story where in the past, when he was thinking about the case, he, he was thinking about his brother instead, but the game was being so vague about it, and it's obviously trying to trick you that he was thinking about the cathedral incident, which I think is kind of shitty. We could also set up a scene where Ryuki meets Uru in private. Ryuki manages to shoot Uru's metal mask off and reveals how Uru looks like, his own brother, at least half of his brother staring right at him. I don't know, maybe I just like angst and maybe this is shit, but I'll gobble it up. Cause I think what makes the first game more personal is that the case was also a journey for Date. The culprit of the case also had a personal connection to him, hence why players tend to be more invested in the story. And I think it's what this game lacks. So adding personal connection to the protagonist might help. I don't know. Just indulging some daydreaming, so don't mind me. Some characters and branching routes weren't even necessary in the game, and it's just there to give you little to no information. Some of the endings end up so abruptly and seemingly unnecessary. They only exist to have some sort of closure for the supporting characters that felt one-dimensional. It tried to follow the first game's formula but somehow made it worse. For example, Lian and Kizuna's. Richie just straight up sends mercenary to deal with Lian, not even considering that his daughter might get roped in. By the way, I thought Richie is going to be a typical rich villain, but it turns out he's surprisingly a good guy. That's pretty interesting. Gen and Amame's route. That ending was fucking wild. Both sends the SAT to capture our protagonist. When they were surrounded, Amame fucking takes the gun from Mizuki, trying to fight back, but fails. And Gen ends up taking bullets for Amame. They use live ammo, by the way against their own abyss agents. Like why? After shooting Gen, they just stand there while he and Almame have a Beauty and a Beast-esque emotional scenes instead of arresting them. Gen rots Anne, like I said, wild and kind of stupid. It was hard to take the story seriously afterwards. Another elephant in the room was Mizuki's twist, which I think was pretty bad. It was the initial point where I started to stop caring that much about the story. You can hear it from my initial reaction. The child had super p- <laughs> Why is it me? Ha 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 Mizuki. And she was adopted. The child's name was... You? Mizuki. Shut the fuck up. Shut- the fuck up. No! No! The family name was Okiera. No! No! I refuse. I refuse to believe that shit. What? What the fuck do you mean, Okiera? No! You guys had a child. I don't like this. M Mizuki, I'm genetically modified? Huh? No fucking way. I refuse to be- I, I, I don't know, I, I'm a bit mixed about this reveal. I thought it was going to be the mask. What about daddy and mom? Yeah! They weren't my real parents? Wait, they, your, your mother was like fucking blue haired girl, what the fuck? I- <laughs> This is probably like written after the first story, isn't it? Mizuki is a fantastic character in the first game, and they decided to retcon her in order to justify the main twist, which I'm unfortunately not a fan of. I don't think it could have worked, it just didn't work unless this was set in an alternate universe that is completely different from the first game. Like it's neither the route we play in the first game a completely new route. If this was not a retcon and there were subtle hints in the first game, that it wouldn't be a problem. But the thing is, the first game already happened, and Mizuki was already written like that. And the player recognized that Renju and Shoko were Mizuki's biological parents. Speculating that Shoko wanted to say, I wish we never adopted you, was such a stretch, it's so unconvincing. Like given how horrible and emotional she was in that moment when she was hitting Mizuki, I think she would definitely blurt out that line. Plus Shoko had motherfucking blue hair. I'm sorry, but in the first game the younger characters like Iris, Mizuki and Ota all have the color of their mother's hair. So seeing Shoko dyed it would have sounded so cheap. So when the twist was revealed, saying Mizuki was actually a stronger clone of the original BB just took me out of the game. Because it turned a gag about Mizuki's anime superhuman abilities in the first game to having a detailed explanation of why she's like that. No one asked for this. Also, why would BB wear the same outfit Mizuki wears six years in the past? You know what? Okay, I can accept them attending the same school but having the same hairstyle? That's just one of the contrivances trying to trick you into thinking you were playing Mizuki in some of the chapters. 
But then I'm quite surprised that by the end, I just kind of accepted it. I understand wanting new people to buy your game, but why focus on the target audience of people who haven't played the first game, when you know the fans from the first game are going to rush and buy this game on day one? I get that some streamers are going to stream the game, attracting people who are not familiar with this game wanting to try it, but I don't think people will just go and get the second one without touching the first game, no? In the very first scene, the host asks you whether you are familiar with the first game, and if you say yes and answer the question they gave out afterwards correctly, it still doesn't affect the game. You just get a hint of Mizuki's leg having a bullet scar and BB doesn't. Let's be real here, very few people are going to notice that small detail. Also, I'm not sure what happens if you choose no, so please do correct me on this. A lot of jokes are mostly callback from the first game. These jokes are what make the first game so charming, but then when it's just a callback in this game, it just feels so underwhelming. But I have to applaud the localization team for trying their best to localize the lantern jokes because it's strictly a wordplay from the Japanese language. But if it's already in the first game, then why bother putting it here just to have repeated content? Also, first time players who play this game wouldn't really care about Date because he's just there. Date has a mask on so as to not spoil his actual identity from the first game is actually so dumb. Like I said just now, couldn't the writer just write this game being set in a separate universe so the event in the first game wouldn't be affected? I feel like either Somnium Files could explore more about the tech other than like the AI eyeballs. Cause like in the first game, why the eyeballs are important is because like Date and the eye were re all related to the Psychop killing case, right? The Psychop killing case, oops. And Iwa is quite prevalent in the story as well as the sync machine, like you know both of them have something to do with eyes. But in this game, she's just there and the machine is now only a tool for the agents to access it. I mean like that's the point, to delve into someone's dream, but like it's not as impactful as the first game where you'd be like, oh my god, a new technology and the machine actually has something to do with the case, you know? But now it's just there, you know, and Pewter didn't get as much screen time, which for me is a bit sad. I thought the second game or, or the future game like DLC or whatever could use other human senses like you know hearing, speech, maybe smell, but that would be kind of weird. I don't know. <laughs> oh, the no nose case. Oh no, the corpse has no nose. Who could have done it? But uh, whatever. I digress. <laughs> um, like okay, don't don't get me wrong. Like I like Tama and Marco. I want to see his model, but anyway, I mean their model, so they're, they're binary, non-binary. But I feel like it would be more interesting to touch upon other senses, like a device for super hearing or whatever. Because like when I was thinking about a sequel, I was thinking, okay, now that they have like done something that's related to eyeballs, like what will they do for other parts of the bodies? You know, you know, like not the half of the body, but you know, like the senses, like they're related to your face or something, you know. Sight. We already did sight. I just want to like see them do hearing or speech or something. That would be super interesting. But then if they want to stick with eyeballs, I wouldn't mind. Plus they never used the six unnamed sinkers that was mentioned in the previous game, which I think was a waste. Maybe this is a hot take, but I'm not so sure. I'm just putting my thoughts out there, so yeah. Oh my god, you know, you know, you, it could be like, if, okay, if they're doing something Oh my, if they're doing other senses in the future, I wish like it would be something like the the three monkeys, I forgot what's it called, like the no hear hear nothing, speak nothing, and listen to nothing, hear nothing, I forgot. Shit, I need to I need to search. I need to Google it now. Yeah, the like the three wise monkey, that's how the, that's what they say. Yes, even like a Japanese like pictorial maxim, you know? It's like a principle, like see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. That would be really interesting, isn't it? We already got a sight. We just need to like, um, you know, um, implement like the hearing and like the speech. Oh my god, that would be so interesting. I feel like Uchikoshi would be the one who would write this kind of stuff. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm not. I I'm pretty sure he won't watch this video. So like, if he's watching it, please, please don't kill me. I'm just. I just really like your work, man. <laughs> Does it sound weird? Anyway, let's just go back to the video. <laughs> Finally, here are some of the plot holes that bothered me while I was playing the game. In the first game, when Mizuki's adoptive parents were killed, why didn't Bibi immediately seek for Mizuki? I don't think she'd be hiding who she is anymore while her sister is suffering mentally from her loss. If the reason is something like boss didn't inform Bibi, I think that's just bullshit. Because the TV broadcast the murder of her parents, Eren close to her knows what happened and how she must have felt. Tama or Aiba never even think to use x-rays to scan the freezer at Brahman for the body, because sometimes the AI boss scans the era without their master's comment like the first game in the cold storage warehouse. 
That's another plot hole in the first game, but we won't be talking about that. Even at the stadium, the AI bot would have noticed the launch pad with a quick scan. Tama never administered an electric shock or injects a sedative or relaxant to Ryuki to incapacitate him in case he goes off the deep end, like when he's trigger happy at the guy working at Misadan. The first game demonstrated that an AI boy is capable of doing this. Hell, even Aiba did this to Date in this game. Also, there's one scene where Ryuki is having a mental episode at Yoyagi Park. Why does Tama let Ryuki stand around for hours without calling anyone to come to get him? He literally stands there from noon to night in the middle of winter, by the way, and no one decides to call the cops or even security guard on him? During a scene where Ryuki sees a blue figure at the cathedral and decides to give chase, the game later reveals the blue figure to be Amame. At the time, Ryuki just contracted TC Birch after opening the box, so it explains why he sees her as a blue silhouette, but why didn't Tama tell Ryuki right away? She's an AI, she's not going to be affected by the hallucination, and since it's deep underground with little signal, Tama's data slash memory couldn't be uploaded to the cloud, so she couldn't remember, but Ryuki can, cause he's a human. It just feels like the game is intentionally hiding this information for the big reveal later on. Even after that, she faces everyone normally, even though it's possible that Ryuki saw her face, and he might tell Mizuki that he saw her at the cathedral. She didn't know he started hallucinating at that very moment, which again feels like the game is hiding something. Terra gives them clue to the Horador Institute basement via balloons. Like why? Why would he give them clues to solve this case? Even if he did, I think it would be better if he used it to bait them to go to the basement and trap them there, right? Like starving them or setting a death trap to kill them in order to get rid of them? When the masked woman takes off her mask, Lian immediately recognizes her as Quartz, his old partner, but he never mentioned young Mizuki looking exactly like her in the future. Lastly, the prototype sink machine at the warehouse gets on into not needing the sinkers to gouge their eyes out to use it. Also, why would you leave this thing here where everyone can get to it? Isn't this a top secret machine? I know the game stated in the appendix that Saito installed a bomb inside the machine to prevent people from stealing, but why would the police not do anything about that? There's a bomb disposal team for a reason, no? Even if they don't bother to disarm the bomb, at least have people got the warehouse? I'm sure there are more in my head, but I'll just stop it here. Despite all the negative things I said, I do like the secret ending and how each new numbers that the player received are different. Once unlocked, the 4-4 breaking moment happens and the main theme plays while Tokiko explains to you that you help her reach Moksha. I also like the line where she says, the intersection between Worf and Weth, that's where the sim can occur, as we're witnessing her escape. You change history if you decide to tell Ryuki everything, and you have an epilogue with all the important characters thanking you for solving the case, it seems a bit too good to be true, and it is. At the end, Tokiko shows up on a stadium leaving the players, I mean the Freyers, to have their own interpretation. And yeah, I don't mind this kind of meta actually, but as for the timeline meta twist, I think the concept sounds nice on paper, but it didn't execute well in the game. I also like that they incorporate ARG in and out of the game to keep people engaging before the game's release. I want to love this game as much as the first game, since it's definitely had some good ideas and twists like half-bodies of Jin and Uru, as well as Saito and Uru being the sons of Soul and Serial Killers, one with father complex and mother complex for the other. I'm just mostly disappointed at how they set up a lot of things only to end up being underwhelming in the end. For now, I think the only saving grace for me are the fan arts and fanfics. They feel the emptiness I felt after I finished the game, so thanks fan artists and fanfic writers. I'm going to draw my fair share of fan arts as well. Nirvana Initiative's ending feels like they are preventing the world from a world ending event, but it isn't worldly enough that it feels like a sandbox. <laughs> Which kinda makes sense, you know? A, a sandbox, a simulation. This game gets likes Ryuki, Gate keeps information from the players, and girl bosses you, which I don't mind. That being said, should a sequel exceed the first game? No, but it shouldn't be a step down either. Regardless, if they are planning for AI3 or even a DLC, I will still look forward to it. Thanks for watching. I really want to chug jug with you. I would classify that as cringe. <laughs>